Hey guys, this is part three of our identifying different insects orders lecture video section. So I hope that you guys are excited. This by no means is inclusive of all the orders of insects, but these are the orders that you're most likely to come across. Endoterigoda are the holometabolith insects, and these are the insects that have complete metamorphosis, meaning that they have a larval stage, a pupal stage, and then an adult stage. Like your butterflies, for example. They have the caterpillar, then the pupa, and then, or the chrysalis, or the cocoon, and then the adult stage. And all of the insects that we are going to be talking about today have that kind of development. This is the outline, and just like always, you can go over there and click and jump to that section of the, the video in case you want to come back later or relearn about a really cool order, because they're all really cool. Um, we're first going to talk about the netweed insects, then talk about beetles, and then earwig flies, hanging flies, and scorpion flies, fleas, flies, true flies, caddis flies, butterflies, and moths, and then your wasps, bees, and ants. Endoterigoda is an unranked natural group right now. In Greek, endoterigoda means internal winged form, and it's referring to that developmental process of the pupal stage in between the larval and adult stage. Up first, we have the Neuroptera, which in Greek means nerve wing, and that's referring to the amount of wing venation these guys have. Their common name is the net winged insects, and their characteristics are that they have a ton of wing venation, all the adults are mandibular, they have really well developed compound eyes, and you can get like really cool pictures of light bouncing off of them in funky ways, and they all have filiform antennae. Neuroptera includes dobson flies, which in some places are crazy and get as big as my hand, lace wings, snake flies, which are these really weird things that live out west, ant lions, owl flies, and this is where the mantis fly belongs. If you remember that crazy picture that I showed you and why taxonomy was important, so the weird crazy mantis fly that looks like half like a mantis and kind of like a fly and kind of like a wasp belongs in this group of the net winged insects. These guys all have a really cool larval stage where they'll have these sickle-like mouth parts that stick off the front of their face. And these mouth parts look like they'd be really good at chomping on something, but they're actually like straws. So they'll go over to their prey and grab it and then stick the sickle-like mouth part into the prey and suck up the fluids from the inside. And so it's really cool because all of these larvae are predaceous and feed this way. Ant lions are in this group and they feed the same way as a larva. In fact, the sarlacc from Star Wars is actually based on the ant lion because the ant lion builds a little like cone shape into the sand and it's constructed in such a way that when ants or other insects fall in, they can't get back out and just like helplessly scramble up the sides while they just like fall into the jaws of this menacing creature at the bottom. The next group is Coleoptera, and in Greek, Coleoptera means sheath wing, and that's because these are your beetles, and their characteristic to identify them are the hardened elytra that cover the hind wings. There is one family of Staphylinid which can look similar to earwigs, so just check for CRC and make sure that you don't get confused because Staphylinids have really, really, really reduced elytra to the point that it doesn't even really look like they have any. There are two major suborders. The first is Adephaga, which includes your ground beetles, or the family Carabidae, and a bunch of your water beetles. Polyphaga is the other suborder, and that includes pretty much all of your other beetles, including scarabs, weevils, lightning bugs, um, stag beetles, and a whole bunch of others. Basically, anything that you would consider a beetle is probably in that group. Anyway, the important thing is there are some ground beetles or carabids that look like other things or other families that would otherwise be in polyphaga. And you can always check to make sure that you are never going to go astray by flipping the beetle over and right where the pronotum connects to the underside of the beetle, if it's in a defiga, there will be a line. It's a suture. It's called the notopleural suture. And if you have a beetle that's in polyphaga, it's not there. And so I have made this lovely figure right over there for you to take a look at. And um, and that should never, never leave you, lead you astray. So if you get a beetle and you're unsure of where to start, flip it over and look for that notopleural suture. 
The next order is Mycopterae. In Greek, Mycopterae just means long wings, and their characteristics are that they have slender bodies and that their head capsule has been elongated, and so it looks like they have a big giant head. Hanging flies are really cool because they have this spike that comes off of their tibia, and so they'll hang at lights near gas stations and stuff and wait for stuff to fly by and then grab it out of the air and skewer it on its spike and then just eat it, which is really metal. These guys look a lot like crane flies, and the way to tell them apart from crane flies is that these guys have four wings and crane flies only have two. So count the wings, and that will help you a lot. Earwig flies... You would be really, really lucky to get my professor blacklights like every night and he's gotten like two ever in the time that he's been at UGA. So they are around here, but it's pretty rare that you'll see them. They look kind of like earwigs because they have those long, weird CRC at the end, but you can tell them apart because they have fully developed four membranous wings. Scorpion flies are really, really cool, and they're actually pretty common around here in late summer, early fall. And the males look like they have a scorpion tail on the back, which actually can't hurt you at all. It's just male genitalia that has been elongated and enlarged to mimic a scorpion tail. And no one's really sure why, but that's what they look like, and it's kind of really awesome. The next order is Siphonaptera, or your fleas. In Greek, Siphonaptera means wingless tube. Their characteristics are that they're really small and their body is flattened like this way and there's a lot of bristles that point backwards and that's to help them A, lie flat against their host and B, stick there and so your dog can't like scratch them out as easily. If you're moving into a new apartment or know anyone who's moving into a new apartment or house, have the carpets cleaned or replaced because fleas can live in your carpet and not eat anything for up to six months. So it doesn't matter if no one's lived there for a really long time because they could be living in the carpet and waiting for you or your friend or wherever. So just go to a new apartment and get your carpets clean. So we've all probably been told that people thought rats spread the bubonic plague or the black plague and then people realized it was actually the fleas, but I'm telling you now that it's actually the bacteria in the fleas that were responsible for the black plague. And that's because Fleas have these really spiky projections in the back of their throat, and those are used for lysing red blood cells. So when they drink your blood, the red blood cells hit these spiky projections and break apart, and they're more easily digestible. Fleas would get this bacteria that would live on them and spread this biofilm across the back of the flea's throat. So what happened is a flea would bite someone, it would try and drink in the blood, but there's thick biofilm produced by this bacteria would prevent the blood from actually getting into the digestive system, the flea would essentially puke it all back up and that would include the bacteria and then it would get on the wound and then the flea's bite is itchy so then you'd itch it and you'd itch the bacteria into your skin and that's how the bubonic plague spread. The next order is diptera and these include your true flies, and the Greek for diptera is two-winged because it's referencing the fact that diptera only has one pair of membranous wings, and then the other pair have been reduced into those nubby haltiers. Diptera has two suborders, and the first is nematocera, which in Greek means thread horn, and that's referencing the fact that this suborder, all of its groupings have antennae that are filiform or thread-like. And... Nemotocera is kind of a toxic waste dump for taxonomy because anything that has filiform antennae and is a fly gets dumped into the suborder whether or not they're related. So this suborder is paraphyletic or polyphyletic. We're not sure which one yet, but hopefully someone soon will come along and make this a happy monophyletic group and break things off that don't belong there. The next suborder is Brachycera, and in Greek, Brachycera means branched horn, and it's referencing the fact that these flies have the air state antennae with the big lobe and the bristle sticking off the tip. Brachycera includes a whole bunch of things that you're probably familiar with, like house flies and blow flies and horse flies and stable flies and a whole bunch of other flies. 
Brachycera is really important for a couple reasons. First, it has a lot of your economic pests like houseflies and stableflies and horseflies. So obviously those are a problem because you have to pay money to get rid of them. But there's also a lot of really important groups like your cheeseflies, blowflies, fleshflies, and houseflies are all used in forensic entomology. And that's really great because we can tell when people died based on certain, certain circumstances and based on what insects are there. So they're like a little crime fighting team. There are also a lot of really important pollinators in this group, and one big family are your hover hoverflies or bee flies, and they're in the family Serpidae. They look really similar to bees and wasps, so just check for the big eyes, the antennae, and how many wings they have. But they're really, really important natural pollinators, and they're one of the few that actually belong in Georgia. So while we give all this credit to the honeybee, the truth is that it's actually been imported from Spain in about 1500s. So it doesn't actually belong here. It's a non-native species. So bee flies are really cool because they are a native pollinator. The next order is Trichoptera, and these are your caddisflies. In Greek, this means hair wing, and that's because if you look at them under a microscope, their wings have little bitty hairs that stick off of them. They kind of look like fragile moths, but they have really long filiform antennae and a medial ocella, so if you're confused or whether you have a moth or a caddisfly, check for those things. Trichoptera have an aquatic larval stage, and the larvae build these cases out of whatever's around, so rocks, pebbles, sticks and leaves, but the materials that they use to make the casing and the way that the casing is formed is pretty specific to what species or genus you have, and so you can actually tell them apart based on their casing materials and shapes. Someone had the bright idea to take Trichoptera larvae and put them in a simulated pool of running water and put gold and pearls and opals and other pretty gemstones in the bottom and let them make the casing out of these gold gems and pretty things. And so once the larva turns into a pupa and it emerges as an adult and flies away, they take the leftover casings, glue them together, and make jewelry out of them, which is really cool and kind of fun if you want to get some. I have a link in the description to where to buy them if you want your own insect-made jewelry. We're in the order Lepidoptera now, and in Greek, Lepidoptera means scale wing because these guys have scales on their wings, and if you look at them under a microscope, then they're really clear to see. This contains your butterflies and your moths, and some other characteristics are that they have really big, four membranous pairs of wings that are usually covered in scales, except for the glass wing butterflies, which only have scales in some parts. Anyway, they're really pretty. Um, and they have the proboscis, so they go around and drink nectar out of plants. So if you're having trouble further identifying some trichoptera from some moths, then check for a proboscis. People generally refer to butterflies as lepidopterans that fly during the day and moths as lepidopterans that fly during the night. But there are day flying moths and there are night flying butterflies and kind of taxonomically or characteristically you can tell them apart because butterflies have antennae with a club at the end and moths have antennae that are either filiform or plumose and so if you get a really shiny butterfly during the day and you pick it up and it doesn't have clubbed antennae you want to start looking in the moth families and not in the butterfly families. A lot of butterflies and moths are really shiny, and so people are studying those nanostructures that make up that, quote, structural color. And structural color just means that light comes into an otherwise clear scale, and what you see is a vibrant color, like blue or green. And you can tell if something is structural color, because if you change the angle that you look at it, you'll either be able to see straight through to the other side, or the color hue will change. And so that means things like peacock feathers that you look at and see every day are actually structural color as well. And so when you look at them, what you're seeing is light bouncing out of a clear nanostructure. And you just see like the golds and the blues and the greens because of how light wavelengths are bouncing back out. Anyway, this is super cool and people are studying it because that means we can improve our fiber optics and we can improve security encoding and people just wanted to make pretty paints and pretty textiles and so there's been a lot of work right now going into studying those nanostructures and studying how we can reproduce them so we can sell them commercially.
The final order that we are going to talk about are the hymenopteran, and in Greek, hymenopteran means membrane wing, and these contain your bees, bees, wasps, and ants, and their characteristics are that they have really big chewing mouth parts. Um, they have two pairs of membranous wings, so as I was mentioning, there's a bunch of flies that look like them. Check for the number of wings that they have, and they have this special thing called hamuli, which I mentioned earlier, and that holds their wings together while they're in flight. This group is really, really cool because this is where a lot of your sociality shows up. So you have eusocial honeybees and eusocial ants, but then you have um, not quite eusocial paper wasps and some other almost social bees, and you have all the way down to like solitary bees and wasps, which is really cool that you can get that degree of sociality just in one group. Ants can make some really crazily amazing structures. So there's this type of mangrove ant that... The, they build their nest near the mangroves, and so they flood every day. That's great because it brings in food, but not so great because your house just got flooded. And so they can build these specialized chambers that never, ever flood. And it's just the way that the pressure builds up when the water comes in that they don't flood ever. And so what they'll do every day is they'll move the larva and their pupa to the specialized chamber that doesn't flood, and then go back, and then they can live in the mangroves and be all happy. Someone excavated leaf cutter ant. Uh, colony and it spread over 50 square meters and over six meters deep into the ground and so that's like a really amazing feat of just like digging and moving dirt and forming a colony that can make something that large. This concludes our abridged study of insect orders. I hope that you guys learned a lot especially with how to identify them and how to avoid getting tripped up and also some cool facts along the way.